huge welcome uh, to Professor Eric Johnson, um, absolute legend in the behavioural science world, uh, incredible author and all-round gentleman and wonderful human. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I could try and do an introduction, but I, uh, I, I'll probably fail miserably, so um, if it's okay, uh, Sir Eric, would it be okay to introduce yourself a little bit and, uh, and share uh, how, how wonderful you are so everyone else knows? <laughs> Obviously, you don't want modesty to be one of the virtues that we talk about. <laughs> Um, so I'm a psychologist by training, and I've been teaching in business schools and working with people and companies and governments for the last 35 years. And it turns out there's a name for what I do, and it's sort of looking at choice architecture. And that has been a ton of fun. The basic idea is that you actually can change the environment where people make choices, and that will change their behavior. And I didn't know I was doing this, so when I started... Um, a long time ago, we, we looked at these things and said, oh, these are amazing human tricks, framing. Look, people will choose this, or you frame it this way, or that, or choose other ways. And then all of a sudden, sometime in the last 15 years, people decide, you know, this is actually something we can use for good. We can help people make better choices by presenting them with choices in a way that will help them do what they would want to do if they really had the time and energy to think about it. So as a psychologist, I've always been interested in application. Uh, thus in part being in the business school. Um, you know, I do theoretical work as well, but you know, the exciting thing is to actually figure out how you can maybe help make the world a better place. It's incredible. And, and your, your most recent book, The Elements of Choice, I saw Danny Kahneman uh, described it as indispensable, uh, which is a, a pretty good recommendation. Um, but uh, I, it, what I love about it is it, it it seems like, as you were saying, you, you work at the business school and a lot of it is how this can practically be applied in, in real life and in everyday life. Um, as I, I guess most of us don't realize is we make you know, millions of choices every day and don't, don't realize that there's someone has designed a lot of them. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I wonder what are some of the, the best examples um, that, you, that you've come across um, so far? So you hit on a really important point, which is that we're not aware that other people could be influencing us or even more importantly, that we can influence other people. So a very simple example from real life was a president of a foundation who was, we were, I had a nice writing fellowship there for a few years. He said, oh, I know what you guys are doing. I do this all the time with my three-year-old daughter. We have a big fight when I ask her, does she want to go to bed? Now, what I figured out is I just say, do you want to fly into bed or do you want to bounce into bed? No more fights. Brilliant. Um, and, you know, that's that was an early example, but sort of gets you along the way of saying, gee, how you pose choices actually can influence what gets chosen. That's absolutely incredible. And I love it. And I, I, I think I saw it. It might have actually been in your nudge stop talk that you were, you showed um, uh, back in the day. I was a pilot and I think you showed a cockpit. Um, I, I I mean, there's tons of design and architecture that goes on there. Um, it, it, I can't remember what was the reason you were showing that again. <laughs> well, I should have I've shown it more clearly. Um, here's here's the <laughs> thing. The thing about most design for choices is it's haphazard. We don't know we're doing anything. So we, you know, some programmer decides, let's put this button there. Let's sort by price, whatever. And we can talk about examples of that in business. But the one thing that really appealed to me about cotton pit design is that that actually is a science. People sit there with pilots and actually say, what's the right place to put various gauges and various buttons? They put people in a flight simulator with a proposed cockpit design and see if they crash at Charles de Gaulle. And if they don't there, they say, let's go to Teterboro and see if they crash there. Or let's go to SeaTac and see if they crash there. So what you end up with is a scientifically designed selection of what gauges and indicators are there that it's proven to produce good outcomes. That doesn't happen. So I tell the longer story about how that design saved famously U.S. Air Flight 1549, which you might remember is a famous flight that landed in the middle of the Hudson River. Particularly memorable for me because I have a view of where I was oh, wow. in town. I was actually in a plane at the time. Um, I took off about two gates away from Flight 1549. Wow. but. What was interesting is that, that gauge, if you read the transcripts, allowed the 
pilot, Sully Slunberger, to focus on the right things. That design essentially saved the plane. He was a skilled pilot, of course, but given a bad design, who knows what the outcome would have been. Mm. And I wonder, I've often wondered with well, two things that, that came to mind when you were talking about that. One was, I think that that started to happen, wasn't it? The U.S. Air Force designed, originally designed a, a, a U.S. Air Force cockpit chair to be uh, designed for the average person but of course there is no average person so people kept on crashing the planes and they realized that actually everything needs to be adjustable um, but the thing I was going to ask was um, uh, that I'm guessing that that you know particularly when you were at a business school you must um, see a lot of other industries must be able to learn from good examples from from different industries if that makes sense um, sorry, I'm not using my words properly, but um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you can understand what I'm trying to trying to trying to get to. So, um, uh, have you seen that happen quite a lot? Where um, yeah, you... let's get back in a second or two to your point about mm. designing things for the individual. The ejection seat example you use is a good example, and not all people need the same design to make good decisions, and that's important. But let's come back to that. <laughs> um, the thing that you're, you're that is interesting is that. So actually, a surprising little amount of learning from one industry to the other. I mean, if you look at websites, they take a while and they've converged into having certain common features. But still, Amazon does not look like Netflix, does not look like the U.S. Airway site, does not look like... I mean, they, 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 there's some principles, and largely that learning comes because they hire the same consultants, but not because they have a good idea of what they want to do with their website or stores. I mean, stores have been with us, grocery stores have been with us for over 100 years. And there's some difference there, but it's taken that long for the standard model to emerge. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I guess, yeah, with, I mean, with, supermar with supermarkets, I, I, I think I've heard you talk a lot about um, default premiums and defaults. Um, and I'd, 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 I think you mentioned a famous example with Safari and Google, is that right? It's um, uh, actually Apple and Google, uh, the iPhone. Yeah. So if you take my iPhone here, it turns out my um, there's a default search engine there. And that search engine, of course, is very valuable property because it means whoever is seeing you type in a flight or tickets you know, for a play captures that information. Now, it turns out that Google pays Apple an estimated $12 billion a year, B. That's like one quarter of what it would cost Elon Musk to buy Google a year, just to be not the required search engine, but the default. Let me just explain what a default means. It means that basically it's the option that happens if you don't make an active choice. So it's pre-selected. It turns out these days, it's actually relatively easy, three or four clicks, and I could change to that. Most people when I talk to them don't even know they have a choice. And when you ask them to look, almost all of them have Google as a default search engine. So that is very powerful and obviously very valuable because this has been the case, this payment has been made by Google to Apple since 2014 and increasing wow. every year. <laughs> yeah, it must be nuts. I mean, I guess in a in a day-to-day -day sort of world, a, a, I know that um, when I was working in advertising, there was often a premium to be on the shelf at sort of eye level. Uh, you pay a, a massive premium for that. because I guess that would sort of also, would that still be a default, do you think, if it's, if it's sort of... I, I don't call that quite a default. It has some right. of the same mechanisms. And one of the things I try really hard to think about is what's in common, because many times in behavioral sciences, you know, Chris, people just have a list of here are a bunch of tricks. You know, we have... <laughs> A bunch of post-it notes but there yeah. really is one person and one psychology that's actually determining how those work so shelf position has in common that it gets you to think about something first right because you think about it because it's right in front of you right. that's one of the ways defaults work defaults you often ask yourself first why is the default a good thing so probably my most famous research um Richard Taylor says that they should put this on my tombstone, uh, is a graph about defaults and organ donation rates in various European countries. And it turns out those countries where you're a donor by default 
which are called opt-out countries, have rates that are closer to 90%. Those countries, like the UK until at least now, but perhaps change, and unlike Wales, which has the other default, in the UK, in fact, you're not a donor, as in the US, unless you choose to be. Now, that has a huge effect on people's willingness to be a donor. And part of that is because people think about what is, why would I want to not be a donor first? Or why would I want to be a donor first? Now, the point is that is actually what happens with the shelf. You think about why is this biscuit the best biscuit for me? And often, because you stop short, it will have an effect. But the difference is it's not pre-checked. It's not something where someone has made the choice for you, although in a subtle sense, they've influenced your choice. So that's one of the big, powerful um, ways that choice architecture works by changing what you th how the order in which you think about things. It's, it's really fascinating. And um, I mean, when you were writing the book, was there a particular reason why you chose to write it now? Um, I mean, I, I, as opposed as a, or was it just uh, you, you, you've been quite busy? Or like, was, there were other alternatives. But I thought it would be useful to summarize where we were. Most yeah. people know about this area because of a fine book called Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, which uh, they claim they've published the final edition. Uh, <laughs> but I think we've learned a lot since Nudge was published in 2008, and it's time for a fresh overview. The other thing I think I, I want to do is bring some idea of what the psychology, what the theory is. Um, not just, I think I have lots of great examples, but also understanding what are the principles that drive choice architecture for two reasons. One is, if you know how choice architecture works, you can choose what is going to be the best tool for you as a, as a designer. So I'm going to call choice architects designers because that's an easier word than repeating choice architect time after time. Second thing, it gives you a chance to um, actually think about new choice architecture, new designs that might work and how they work. There's actually a third thing, which is it sort of helps you understand the ethics of choice architecture. That is, if it's something that people are aware of and they know about, fine, there's no ethical issue. But if it's something like many defaults where people don't think the default influences your choice, then I think there is an ethical issue, particularly if you're trying to choose defaults that might be in your interest, but not in the decider's. The, the chooser's best interest. You, you must have uh, some incredible examples of, of bad defaults. Uh, are there, do you have any favorites? Bad for the chooser, particularly. Um, yeah, yeah. There yes. are certainly many, and you know you don't have to look far to find them, but one of my favorites is a co court case that was brought by the American Federal Trade Commission. This website had basically, give, you, you got something for free, and then they had four choices underneath the thing you got for free. Only one of them was pre-checked and it cost you $10 a month. And it appeared below the screen. So unless you scrolled up, you never saw it. Wow. So there's a default that, and obviously since the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission was involved, um, you know, that they, they were told not to do that. But that's to me a good example of a very sneaky default very yeah. sneaky choice architect. Uh, do you think, I mean, a lawmaker's going to have to look at this more? Like, how, how would they be able to judge some of these things as well? I mean, that, that one sounded, you know, pretty clear cut. It was just <laughs> horrendous. But, um, I mean, I'd imagine these kind of bad, bad, bad defaults uh, happen a lot. I mean, maybe in, particularly in the finance industry, maybe, I'd imagine. Uh, oh, certainly in finance. Um, also, just think about when you go to a website and it asks you to make a decision about the cookie policy, <laughs> you'll notice one button saying, leave things alone is typically bright red or bright blue. The other <laughs> button that says, I want to make, I want to manage cookies is yeah. usually gray on gray. It's very hard to see. Um, so how would you regulate that is a very good question. And it's not an easy question to answer because choice architecture is always going to be there. And sometimes you want an option that most people will choose to be the red button. So for example, um, 
here's a here's an example. There are conferences where you get to choose the food. You know, do you do you want different foods to have different colored buttons? Yeah. You know, I think that's that's you know very interesting. You may, if you want to encourage, say it's an environmental conference. This has actually been done. You want to encourage people to eat vegetarian. Maybe you make the vegetarian button red, and the meat button harder to see. Given most people going to that conference probably think that's a good idea, you've actually increased, you know, the number of people who get what they want. So yeah. it's more difficult than saying the buttons have to be the same color. Yeah, yeah I'd imagine. Um, and I mean, I guess when you're when you're looking at choice cho choice architecture, is there a possibly a hard question to answer? But is is there a a, a an optimum number of options that we can deal with as as individuals as humans because um, I mean sometimes you look at stuff and it, you know you look at a menu at a restaurant and there's like a million million options I've no idea where to start um, yeah and, and there's this whole literature that talks about the curse of choice in German even rhymes it's called the qual de val the, uh, you know the, the how you know the, how bad it is to have too many choices. And we all feel that. But there's also something else that happens when we get an option, which is it could be different from the first option. In fact, the reason we make a choice is because somebody wants to know what we want. Right. Now, that doesn't mean you have to give people 120 options arranged alphabetically, which unfortunately is very often done. Um, my favorite example of this is in uh, choices of healthcare policies are often, in the state of Utah, I believe they had 124 policies. Wow. And imagine those are arranged alphabetically. That's not a good idea. But what you could do is arrange those in some way and actually give yourself an aid to find the right ones. Uh, maybe you ask someone what their goals are. And if you do, then you can give them a set that's smaller. They still have, in theory, the broader set they could choose from. But they're more likely to end up with a small set that's appropriate to them. I call this a choice engine, some an engine which actually makes it easier for you to make a choice. And if the designer has your intent in mind, it could be helpful. My, my naive English uh, solution would be to give everyone universal health care. <laughs> that, indeed, that, that indeed might be a better solution. Um, <laughs> But I do think we would agree that 124 is probably too many. Yeah. Um, and yeah. even then, obviously, there are choices involved in the NHS. You can decide uh -huh. to see somebody outside the system. You can just, there are different kinds of options. So there are still, even in a, in a, in a single payer pro system like okay. the NHS, choices are presented to people. Your doctor, when you see them, is going to present you with choices. They're a designer. You know, so yeah. there's no getting around design, even in a even if a small set of choices. Well, that, that sort of tips that you use in your own life to help you make make better decisions when you're confronted by an onslaught of options. Um, that may be another reason I wrote the book is to teach myself <laughs> what I think I should do. <laughs> I do think knowing when you've seen the right number of options and not feeling obsessed to look at everything at the same time you know i just was booking a hotel you know i wanted to make sure that i looked at more than one option it turns out when you look at people's behavior on websites they tend to only click through to one hotel and economists have looked at that and that costs them money they should be searching more um, and so what we should be doing and what i should be doing when i design things for myself is making search easy so if I am going to give you five or six options, maybe I should say these are the ones that are close to the airport, but more expensive. These are the ones that are farther from the airport, but less expensive. Which do you want? You know, here's the average price. So you can actually arrange the choice in a way that makes a big number of options more feasible. That yeah, make, makes a lot of choice, uh, <clears throat> a lot of a lot of sense. And um, I think I was. I was reading a lovely article from you, um, I think you posted the other day on, I was going to say the Wall Street Journal, but I might get this wrong. It was on uh, uh, how to choose the right the right credit card for you or the right type of card that's right for you. I think that's something that people often struggle with. 
is, uh, is, is how to get that right because it's also written in it's so complicated uh, the, the, the paperwork that you get with all of that sort of stuff and then the way that they display the figures and the interest rates are also often uh, often done uh, done a bit strangely but um, yeah have you got any advice on that actually well, well I think there are a couple things one thing you're pointing out that actually this is a case where it's probably the case that complication doesn't help you make a better choice. In fact, there's something very fundamental about credit cards that makes it hard. And it's true of most consumer finance, which is that you have properties that are going to go against each other. What we academics call negatively correlated. You're good on one, you're going to be bad on the other. So for credit cards, for example, that's often um, there's an annual fee, which is the fee that you're charged for your balance over time. And then there's a teaser rate. It's sometimes called, or an initial introductory rate. And that, as actually it turns out, the lower the introductory rate, the higher the long-term rate's gonna be. So you can't just pick one. I want the one with the lowest introductory rate because you're gonna end up paying more money later. And so that is a good example of where it's very difficult. Um, what I suggest in the article is that you can actually just average those two. If you know you're gonna have a credit card for, for two years, you can actually figure out what's the average interest rate over that. Then now you have only one number to worry about, and that's going to be a lot easier. So it's being smart. You have to do some, as the British would say, maths. But yeah. you can make those maths easier by doing things like that. Um, credit card choice is very difficult. I, uh, I did spend some time uh, as a senior advisor at the uh, equivalent, the U.S. equivalent of the Financial Conduct Authority, which is called the Consumer F uh, Financial Protection Bureau. And it's amazing um, how difficult some consumer choices are. Um, and that's a place where, you know, most people just want to make sure the information is there. And it's hard for them to think about how to present the information in a way that will make consumers make better choices. But as the director recently pointed out in a blog post, if we can make the information easier to process, the markets become more competitive. And actually, consumers will be better off if the market's competitive. So there's a sense in which bad charge architecture actually is in some firms' best interests. Not the best firms, actually, the mediocre firms. Yeah. But it's in the, the, the best interest of mediocre firms, but not in consumers' best, best interest. And actually, I think a really important role of regulators is to make sure people can make intelligent choices. And I guess like a, a, a huge... A huge number of the of our audience are sort of people in in marketing or, or people starting their own businesses. Um, do you have any sort of advice that you normally give give those sort of people? Um, some apart from obviously read your book. Uh, <laughs> tip number one. Um, <laughs> and buy buy copies for all your employees. Yes, um, of course. <laughs> but I I do think there's a generic thing, and I find this all the time with my students I teach at Columbia Business School. And they think about the product the way they think about it. They don't think about the product the way their customers think about it. You know, they might do a focus group, but even then they don't really necessarily listen. And um, there's lots of examples of this, but as a result, they end up paying attention to features that are less important to the customer and more important to them. Engineers tend to think about performance characteristics more than they should maybe aesthetic characteristics. And there's lots of examples of that. So, so we all have our own biases, I guess. Um, so is the way to overcome that then just make sure you have, <laughs> ask more, more questions or ask opinions from different people? Uh, when you're and designing. certainly listening is useful. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things that is often done with websites that can be done anywhere is not a focus group because then people are talking to each other, but actually just listen to one person going through the site and seeing where they're confused. Another way of doing it, which is a little, which is quite a bit more techy actually, but increasingly doable, is you can watch people's eyes as they look at the website, eye tracking. And everyone I know who's watched someone do this is amazed that, oh, you're looking at that, we want you to look at this. We want you to look at how excellent our stock returns are. Instead, you're looking at the, the picture of the family that's smiling. I um, mean, it's actually quite eye-opening, pun sort of intended, yeah. to watch 
The eye, by the way, it's actually interesting, is actually a still camera. We think of it as if it was a movie camera, a TV camera, and it's continuous. It's actually taking a series of snapshots. So if you actually look at someone reading, their eye will move, stop, move, stop. And so it's incredibly informative to look at the areas where the eye is stopped, because that's when it's actually seeing things. So one way to get outside of your head, inside your consumer's head, is to actually watch your consumer make the choice using eye tracking. That's yeah, a fascinating thing. Um, I, I remember, um, I mean, it's possibly not, not related, but it, it's sort of, uh, we're talking about the way that the eye acts as a camera and sort of has a, you know, we all have a sort of a standard refresh rate of, uh, of, of everything, which is why the motion appears smoothly. Um, but uh, I remember always always thinking in the back of my head, why, why do birds always only fly out of the way of our cars at the last possible moment uh, it's like they're they're sort of uh, are they thrill seekers or something and and i remember a, a scientist telling me that they have a much higher refresh rate um on their on their eyes so to them it looks like the car's going you know half the speed that we're we're going so they're like oh we've got loads of time to move <laughs> uh, every now and then they don't judge it right but it's almost if we were looking at the bird it would be like we're moving in slow motion so their refresh rate is much higher. So that was, anyway, totally random thing, but um, no, but, you, uh, but, but interesting. You, I mean, our eyes, you know, are literally how we make decisions along with our memory. And right. if you understand what information someone's looking at, you're going to understand a lot more. Sort of like you're trying to understand the bird. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I love I love ask asking random questions. Um, <laughs> The uh, speaking of a random question, I I, um, I think I heard that you had an amazing mentor, um, and I, I I was looking up a little bit about him, but um, yeah, I wondered if you'd mind sharing a bit of that story because it's. Um... I've been incredibly lucky, um, um, and I do think it's luck. Um, I went to Carnegie Mellon for graduate school, and um, the person who was soon to become the first psychologist to win the Nobel Prize was a amazing man named Herbert Simon, who started out in political science and sort of ended up doing computer simulation, um, very well known. And, you know, it was actually quite a, an interesting thing. And he had a story which I loved in one of his books, which is um, quite relevant to what we're talking about. He says, imagine you're at the beach and you're watching an ant. And the ant is zigzagging and it looks very complicated. He says, it turns out that, of course, the ant has a very simple goal. It wants to get from the, the ant hole to the food and back. What's making the behavior complicated is the environment. They're avoiding stones, and avoiding feet of people. You know, what they're doing is actually trying to get from A to B, but do it while surviving. And what this really means is that if we're trying to understand someone making a decision, the person is complicated, certainly more complicated than the ant. But the environment is what's producing a lot of the behavior that looks complicated. So that you know was was very memorable. And then the other person who I um, many people were great mentors, but another person who was very influential. So I then got to do a, a postdoctoral fellowship thanks to the National Science Foundation with uh, Amos Tversky, who was wow. would have been the second or tied for a second psychologist. And unfortunately, he passed away before they gave the award to Danny Kahneman. But uh, that was actually a, a wonderful year that I spent uh, at Stanford working with him. What, what was Amos like? Was he um, as, as sort of uh, as, as fun and uh, as, as Danny? Or they, I mean, they might, I'm guessing they must have had different they, But you, if you, if you, if you, I mean, you don't have to take my word for it. Michael Lewis in uh, his book has described yeah. them as wonderful opposites. Um, and... But, you know, as a young PhD student, or at that time, freshly minted PhD, there's another word that would come to mind, which is intimidating. Right. The, not that they meant to be, but, you know, particularly Amos, who I knew well, was very fast. And, you know, writing with him back in the days where people wrote on paper, you know, I would hand him my printout of my nice, you know, best draft, and about a third of it might live. Um, and he was right. It was much better. I hope one of the things I've learned to be is a better writer as a result of that. Uh, um, well, I'm sure you are. If your book reviews are anything to go through, uh, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's got a lot of praise from everywhere around the world. So, um, I mean, congratulations. I think 
anyone who's trying to help people uh, become uh, or make better choices and, and, and make their lives a little bit easier is uh, yeah it's always an incredible human in my book so bravo on you uh, for, for all your, your great work um, I, uh, I wanted to end by just asking you a really uh, silly question uh, that we tend to ask everyone on the on the on the podcast and it's uh, if you had to you know would you rather always sing whenever you had to talk or dance whenever you wanted to walk it's interesting because i have been an amateur musician and um i i'm a better musician but worse vocalist than i might be a dancer so i i think the the dancing might appeal to me but only because i'm such an awful singer um on the and other hand if you the type of dancing <laughs> oh um there there no, there's an old cartoonist jules pfeiffer who used to talk about interpretive dance that's probably what would would emerge it would be part of the nice. communication um but it's, nice. it's 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 a, it's a great silly question now what i really would want <laughs> to do is so. play bass which is my musical instrument um <laughs> i think that would be a lot more fun well that that that, that can be the answer then <laughs> dance and play bass or just play bass uh, <laughs> um, and um, yeah I mean where, where uh, if, just if people want to obviously if they want to buy your book uh, the best place to go I imagine is any good bookshop um, or if you've got access to the internet probably Amazon is your friend uh, <laughs> uh, but there are other websites of course that you can go right. to and, and there's actually um, uh, a website theelementsofchoice.com all right Marvelous. and just you know and uh, there, there are a lot. There are many Eric Johnsons, including, by the way, a Grammy Award-winning guitarist, who's not me, um, but Eric J. Johnson. You see, you'll, you'll find me. <laughs> so yeah, the Elements of Choice dot com, uh, best website to go. Uh, we'll put the link uh, in the in the description here as well. But um, so Eric, thank you so much for for taking the time uh, to talk with us. I, I really appreciate it and. Um, yeah, it's been a, a, such an honour and, and really thank you for all you do um, and, and, and I hope you keep on doing it uh, for a long, long time. Uh, it's very inspirational, so thank you. Thanks. Chris, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. I hope your listeners will enjoy this.